Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody, so much for having me tonight. So now we will talk about how we can live and learn in the metaverse. My name is Andy, and I will be your guide into the metaverse tonight. So you might have recently watched the Super Bowl, and you might have come across this kind of weird ad with this animatronic dog who puts on a virtual reality headset and then goes into the metaverse and meets a bunch of his friends there who are also animatronics, and it was, it was kind of a weird and creepy ad. And at the very end, they were dancing together, even though it really didn't make much sense. And at the very end, we saw this screen here that was advertising a Foo Fighters concert in VR. The Foo Fighters, of course, being an American rock band. And so apparently this concert happened, and then the next day we saw this. Meta's Foo Fighters Quest livestream plagued with connection issues, and Meta's Foo Fighters Super Bowl VR concert failed in the most basic ways. So it looked like we had a front row seat to the growing pains of the metaverse. And the question now is, how did we get here? How do we get to the point that the Super Bowl, which is the most televised event in the country, had so many ads about the metaverse? And the first chapter in my talk is going to be devoted to science fiction and dystopia. Because the term metaverse comes from science fiction. Specifically, it comes from Neil Stevenson's 1992 novel Snow Crash. And in Snow Crash, the metaverse describes an environment where users control representations of themselves to escape reality. And that should sound kind of familiar because we have been living with these systems for quite some time. If you think about something like Second Life or World of Warcraft, and especially social media, where oftentimes we control representations of ourselves that might not be 100% truthful if we're being honest. So I would argue that we are at a point now where the original metaverse idea actually feels kind of old because it was foreshadowed by science fiction. And likewise, our image of the immersive technologies used by the metaverse have also been foreshadowed by sci-fi. So in this talk, I will focus specifically on virtual reality, which I consider a key technology for the metaverse. So if you think back to this creepy animatronic dog, you can see that it is wearing an Oculus Quest, which is a VR headset, as you can see here on the slide. And these are just some images from Hollywood movies that show you immersive technologies. On the top left, you can see um, Ready Player One, the VR headset. Then on the top in the middle, you see Tom Cruise solve crime using an augmented reality interface in Minority Report. And I have no idea how the system would actually work in real life, but it looks really cool. And then on the right side, you can see some screenshots from The Matrix, which of course is a science fiction movie about humanity being trapped inside of a virtual simulation of our world called The Matrix, with some brave individuals being liberated, plugging themselves back into The Matrix, and trying to liberate all of the others. The only device on this slide that's actually real is in the bottom row, the second picture from the left, that is the Microsoft HoloLens, which is an augmented reality device. And another really interesting immersive technology, and really dystopian, is from Ray Bradbury's novel Fahrenheit 451, and it's the parlor wall. So in this novel, the parlor wall is a screen the size of a wall, and so you would be living, you would be sitting in your living room, and you would be surrounded by two, three, or four parlor walls, depending on how much you can afford. And on the parlor wall would be faces that spew content at you all day long, talking to you constantly. And in 1953, when this novel was published, the idea of having a TV the size of a wall that talks to you was unthinkable. So a key feature of virtual worlds is that everything in them is modeled and can be controlled via code. So look at these two pictures here. On the left side, this is a physical building. This is Ladi Hall on IU campus. And on the right side is a virtual model of that same building. Now in this virtual model, we have access to everything inside of that model, every wall, every staircase, every door, in a way that we simply don't have in the physical world. But of course, most of what I've talked about so far just covered fiction. However, if you look at, the, if you look at these images here, the parlor wall has actually become reality. On the right side, you can see a zoom window. Many of us, in the past two years especially, have spent the majority of our school and work life in front of Zoom, where we literally have little parlor walls of windows, of, of little faces coming past us, spewing content us all along. I see a lot of nodding here. Yeah. On the left side, this is the landing page of YouTube, where similarly, we are being constantly serenaded with curated content just for us. And it is very easy to brush aside these emerging technologies by saying, oh, this is just a fad. 
So you can see here on the top left, social media in 2005 was something that college students did. And then you had this unprecedented technological adoption. And now in 2022, social media CEOs regularly are being called in front of Congress and the Senate to testify about the societal implications of their work. And so likewise, VR in 2022 oftentimes feels like a Wild West playground. So you can see my buddy Daniel from work here and myself just kind of goofing around with these virtual reality headsets. But who knows what this technology is going to be able to give us in 2020X, given all of the resources that are being poured into it. So what is this metaverse that everybody talks about actually like? I went into the metaverse for you, and I want to show you what I saw. So I visited three metaverse apps, worlds, workrooms, and, uh, and venues. And so first I had to get ready. On the left side, you see me pick a home. I first went into this ski chalet. Then I got bored of that and went to a space station. And finally, I settled for a futuristic city. On the right side, you see me choose an outfit, which is incredibly hard because there's so much to choose from. So I ended up just wearing what I'm wearing right now, sort of. I was trying out different things here. Um, and then here, this is what other people actually saw of me. So you can see I could shoot out these emojis out of my thumbs. You can also see I have no legs. So it turns out tracking legs in VR is a huge technological challenge. And so if you go into the metaverse yourself, you will see that nobody has legs there. Um, on the left side, you can see me play a game. I was not very good at it. Once I left the safe zone, I got KO'd immediately by another player. And on the right side, you can see my buddy Bruce and me sit in a virtual work environment, just kind of goofing off. And then we are going to a whiteboard, drawing some graphs, and then we give each other a very satisfying virtual reality high five here. Felt very real. Um, so we have seen what the metaverse was predicted to be. We have seen what it actually is right now. So the question then is, what can we actually do with VR today that is useful? So because virtual worlds are modeled, we can measure everything that people do in it. Again, on the left side, if you want to measure what people do in a physical building, you need to put sensors into it, or you need to observe them. Depending on your circumstances, that might be technologically, morally, ethically unfeasible. But in a virtual environment, you control everything that the user does. And likewise, you define the very physical rules that guide 3D model that you're working with. So that means you can measure everything that people do in it. And this includes the user's movement. And at this point, I want to briefly zoom out and point you to this fantastic character caricature on the right. This is from Donovan uh, O'Sullivan and Igo's fantastic book on physical computing, where they asked, if you could talk to a computer and ask it, hey, how do you imagine a, um, a, f a human being to look like, just based on the interactions that you have with it every day? It would probably say something like this, one gigantic eye, two ears, and a big finger. Because think about how you use the computers in your life, including your smartphone, you use your fingers all the time. Sometimes you use, you use two in very rare occasions. And it's unfortunate because the human body is capable of incredibly beautiful and natural motion with our hands and feet and our torso. So consider here on the left side, this is a mouse, a very widely used input device. A mouse has three buttons, left, right, and middle, and it has a two-dimensional position when you move it across the desk. Now on the right side, you see two virtual reality controllers. So first and foremost, we have two controllers because we have two human hands. Likewise, we have a plethora of buttons that we can press in any combination. And likewise, we don't just have two-dimensional position, we have three-dimensional position, including rotation. So this way we can use our hands, which are just marvels of evolution, to generate really beautiful dynamic input that can then be read by a computer. So here on the top left, you see my colleague Medina in the lab playing around with a virtual reality headset. And on the right side here, you can see, for lack of a better term, what the computer is seeing. These are two fully parametrized models of these controllers that Medina is holding. And fully parametrized means we have full access to it via code. On the right side, you can see all of the raw data that comes out of this headset in real time. These are just two variables, the, X, the Y position, so how high is she holding it? And then in the bottom left, we can draw uh, a graph of that. So now you can see she's resting. And then she's doing this wavy motion. And now we have the same kind of wave pattern appear in this graph. And this data comes to us basically for free. And we just have to write a couple of lines of code, which is awesome. So this means that we can show somebody who is in VR visualizations of their own movement data 
while they are in VR. And then maybe, maybe they can learn from it. So in my dissertation, I asked people to travel through a virtual building as fast as possible. And I wanted to check if they can beat their own time in a second trial after having seen a visualization of their own movement. And so this is really where I want to hone in on my uh, research area, which is virtual reality and data visualization. So this is a quote by a German computer scientist, Daniel Keim. Visual data exploration seeks to integrate humans in the data exploration process, applying their perceptual abilities. The basic idea is to present the data in some visual form, allowing data analysts to interact with it. So what this quote really speaks to is the symbiosis of computers and humans that is only possible through visualization, because visualization, after all, is for humans only. And also visualizations of VR data are just especially beautiful. You can see some more examples here from my dissertation. So for the study, we had the same virtual building that I was showing earlier. In figure number B on the right, you can see the inside of the building. And in figure C, you can see the view up on the top floor. We gave our subjects a total of 24 tasks. That's six tasks over four rounds. You can see in figure A here that the user was starting at the top of the stairs. And then they had to navigate to these tasks. The first task was a practice round so that they could get familiar with the system. And then we gave them three movement methods, walking, teleporting, and free flying. And in the fourth round, they could freely choose what they wanted to do. And these tasks got harder and harder. Task one and two were still relatively close to the start position, but task number five was down in the basement of the building. So in order to finish a task, they had to find these rooms, and they had to put their right hand onto the wall for one second, and then the task was completed, and they could move on to the next task. And here you can see the navigation methods. So on the top left, we see walking. The user just looked into a direction, pressed a button, and then they would be walking. For teleporting, the user pointed their controller at the ground, and then they clicked the button, and then they were just teleported ahead. For free flying, they were essentially becoming Superman. They could fly into any direction that they wanted. They could go through walls, ceilings. There was no gravity either. And for the choice between all three, we gave them a radial menu so that they could switch between these three methods at any point in time. And then we took half of our subjects and we showed them their own data back in VR. So this is a VR user with a miniaturized model of Luddy Hall with a colorful trajectory inside of how they had been moving beforehand. And we can see that this data was just beautiful to look at. So in figure A, you can see we had these subdued dark background colors with these popping trajectories that showed where the user had been walking, teleporting, or free flying. And because every user generated so much data, we had to give them a way to uh, understand which tasks had been bad and which tasks had been good. So in figure B, we gave them a bar chart. On the x-axis, you have all 24 tasks. And on the y-axis, you have the completion time in seconds. So this way, the user could look at it and be like, oh, wow, this bar is really tall. I did really bad there. Or, wow, this bar is really short. So I think I did a good job there. And then they could hone in on the data that was of particular interest to them. The question in science is always, did it work? The answer here is yes. So people who saw their own data were faster than those who had not seen their own data by one second, which is averaged over all of the users and over all of the tasks. And it does not seem like a lot, but this kind of result had a high significance. And this is the kind of statistical proof that we need to show that our intervention in this case was successful. So. I want to finish this talk by sharing my thoughts on the road ahead for the metaverse. So first and foremost, we have to acknowledge that huge issues persist. I can't stand on the stage and not at least acknowledge this. The metaverse already has a huge harassment problem. It has issues with privacy. It has issues with surveillance. All of the issues that we have with the internet in general follow us into the metaverse. And just to paraphrase Mark Zuckerberg, in the metaverse, we don't just consume the content, we are in it. And it then follows logically that the issues also follow us into the metaverse and they embody us. So while these issues persist, I would argue that the metaverse is also the ultimate playground. Because both playgrounds and VR exist in their own space and time. Think back to when you were a kid and you had recess, you could go out on the playground that existed in its own bubble. Likewise, when you put on a virtual rea reality headset, you are literally in your own space at this point. Likewise, both playgrounds and VR invite transgression, within reason, of course. When you were a kid on the playground, trying out a toy that you were in a way that you were not supposed to, 
or that you were maybe too little for, or trying to stay out a little bit longer than the teacher would allow you. Likewise, in VR, playing a game, it is so much fun trying to tug at the seams, like poke your head through the walls and try to see if you can break the game or play it in a way that it was not intended to play. Similarly, both playgrounds and VR need interaction. You don't just go to a playground and do nothing. You want to jump on things, you want to swing on things, you want to play with your friends, you don't just stand and watch. Likewise, in VR, when you put on a headset, you don't just stand there. You want to do something that maybe you wouldn't do in real life, like swim really fast, or climb really high, or jump really high, or put yourself into a danger that you wouldn't put yourself in uh, if it were in the physical world. And then finally, and I think that's the most important point, both playgrounds and VR are social spaces. I spend a lot of time in my dissertation developing the experiment that I was showing you by myself in VR. And I'm really glad now that the metaverse is becoming a very social place where we can not only meet people that we have not met yet, but also be together again with people that we already know. And likewise, if you go to a playground as a kid, you don't go there by yourself, you go there with others. And we have to learn to co cohabitate and to live together in this new world. So my final thought for this talk is that we should play and find out what the metaverse holds together. So because I'm an academic, here's a long slide of scientific references and other sources. And now I can finally say thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Thank you.